Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Marianne Wolf. We are going to hear today from the two most recent North Carolina Principals of the Year about the coming school year, teacher recruitment, and what schools need now more than ever. We'll also hear from students about how they are feeling about the start of school. I'd like to welcome to the show our 2020 and 2021 Wells Fargo, North Carolina Principals of the Year. Keisha Clemens is the principal of Shuford Elementary School in New Newton County Brook City Schools, and Elena Ashburn is a principal of Broughton High School in Wake County Public Schools. Thank you both so much for being here. I'd love to just start, I mean, here we are getting ready to start a school year after what we know was such an unusual and challenging year already. And I'd love to hear you both share a little bit about the primary challenges or opportunities that you're thinking about in anticipation of the coming year. The first thing that um, is, a, is a challenge for us and will continue to be this upcoming year is, is safety. And, you know, I know that we have recommendations to wear masks and to make sure that we encourage um, people to be vaccinated, but the numbers are still spiking. So that going into a new school year is always concerning keeping an eye on the numbers and thinking about ways that we can make sure that our students stay safe. You know, I oftentimes say that, you know, the first day of school, I always talk to kids about my, my role as a principal and the importance of making sure that they're safe and that they're learning. And so now we're in a unique position because, you know, we have adults that are not all vaccinated. We, um, in, in our district, uh, as many districts are going to be starting the year off with optional masks. And so um, as, as a principal, the challenge is thinking about all those protocols that we need to create to keep everyone safe, both students and staff. And today is our first day back uh, to school with our teachers, but we're already dealing with some positive cases. So um, that's just something that, you know, we are always trying to think ahead of the game and making sure that we have the correct and adequate protocols and procedures to put in place for our students. Um, I also think that, you know, um, this year is such a great opportunity. We've had a lot of challenges, but I think what educators have done best is turn those challenges into opportunities. You know, we think about um, how we've been able to uh, provide things to students and thinking about how we can provide access to school beyond just the school building itself. And so I think there's a great opportunity to do some really great flipped instruction, even when students are face-to-face. -face. So um, it, is, it has pushed us to think uh, a broader about what we can do and how we can reimagine education. But I think one of the most important things that I think has been is, is a challenge for us, but a great opportunity this year that I'm excited about in my school is, um, you know, we have we have we've known that there are a lot of inequities within our school, and I think the pandemic has brought light to that. And there are many scholars and practitioners that have grounded their work in in that for years and years. But I think now it is more visible to others that may not have seen it before. So I'm really excited about. Um, you know, our staff engaging in some work to be culturally responsive educators. And, you know, especially with the increase uh, and the shifts in our, in our demographics, the increase in students of color, and we're learning a lot about how culture impacts learning. So those are some great opportunities that we are looking forward uh, to this year at Schubert. Elena, I'd love to hear from you on the high school level, which obviously is a very different scenario than Keisha's school. Thanks, Keisha. Um, you got us started off in such a great way. I, you know, a lot of what she said does resonate with me and our staff at the high school level as well. I think the opportunity that we have here is that the past year taught us that we are much more malleable and much more innovative than we could have ever imagined. Um, and that's not just teachers. I mean, students and parents and community members as well. So I see that as the opportunity. Let's implement some of those learned lessons from the past year where students and staff benefited from, and let's do what's best for kids each day and use that into our practices moving forward. So not returning to an old normal, but returning to a new normal where we are more innovative and more collaborative and more malleable. Um, some of the challenges, of course, that we see is really for me as the principal is we're going to have to help people come back, right? And meet them where they are. Um, so there were many obstacles for people in the past year, students, staff, parents, and it's our responsibility as school leaders 
to meet people where they are, to welcome them in as they are, and to see how they can be supported so that we can move forward together. Well, Ellen, that's actually a great um, point for us. I'd like to go a little further on is, how do you think the needs of students will be different this year? Because I think in talking with both of you and some other educators and principals and even families, we're hearing some of that. And I wonder if you have some thoughts on how the needs might be different, but also how do we support our educators to support our students? I think there will be, I think when I think about the challenge there, um, which what can become overwhelming for me is thinking about the massive um, breadth of what the challenges are, right? And so we have to just kind of take a deep breath and realize there are going to be some students returning to us that maybe have not engaged in school for a year and a half. And then there are other students who will come back to us that were logged in every day doing the work with us. Um, so there's going to be a wide variety of academic needs and emotional needs. Um, some kids are coming back from some serious trauma. Some teachers are coming back from some serious traumas from the past year. So it's important that we listen to them, we support people where they are, and that we're strategic in that support. So specifically thinking about how do we leverage the emotional, social emotional supports that we have in our building, our counselors, our psychologists, and then also thinking about um, tiering our instruction um, in the best way possible for kids into the core instruction so that we can ensure that we're meeting kids wherever they are when they come into our classroom. And really, as you said, like with our teachers, making sure that they know to, um, while it can be overwhelming to just take one day at a time, one kid at a time, that we help them and meet them where they are. Keisha, I know you're thinking a lot about this too. And uh, what are you and other educators doing this year that you think is unique to meet those needs that have emerged and also that maybe we all have a better understanding of than we did before? Elena, you know, uh, said it so eloquently, you know, social and emotional needs of our students, we're going to see an increase in that. And, and, you know, our students have been carrying a heavy load, you know, whether they've had changes in their homes, whether they have had to deal with loss of loved ones, or, you know, many of them know social interaction, you know, with their peers and adults. So I think that one of the things that we have to do you know, as principals and as leaders is to make sure that, you know, our educators are, are so pressured with, you know, we got to teach content, we got to raise test scores. And I think that we have to make sure that we slow down and take time and emphasize the importance of making sure we're taking care of kids, that we're getting to know them, that we are seeing and hearing them every day, that they are not visible, that we are honoring who they are and their identity, but then embedding strategies that promote social and emotional skills within the classroom. And, and sometimes there's small things like building in breaks and physical activity and opportunities for you know, peer and group collaboration. Those are things that can be done and embedded and, and time made for those things. But I also think that we have to uh, realize that you know, there are students and, and staff that have needs that are more intense. And that's why it's so important to have you know, mental health therapists. Um, on our campuses and access to that to provide, um, you know, supports for our students. You know, we are a school that prides ourselves on personalized learning. So, you know, we are digging deeper into um, uh, what the operations of that looks like in our classrooms and in our schools and, and taking that to the next level to understand um, the needs uh, of our students and making decisions on how we accelerate learning, because I think oftentimes we've approached it through a deficit approach. So um, we're spending our time in really checking our minds, understanding mindsets, thinking about how those mindsets, language, uh, and actions that we need to take as educators, as educators to be culturally responsive, to make sure that um, you, that we are providing students and meeting them where they are. You know, we're learning a lot about culture and how it impacts the brain. Um, you know, we're working to really elevate the voices of our communities, especially the communities that are historically marginalized and, and, and redesigning our systems. So all these pieces together are gonna go help to, to creating a, a, a new, a new uh, system that we have for and that we want for our students. So we're excited about the work. After the break, we'll be back with more from our principals. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others, enriching lives. We are back with our 2021 and 2020 North Carolina Principals of the Year. 
listening to both of you in different parts of our state at different grade levels, but still we're all in this together and it's every single educator, every single student, every single family, right, is somehow going back to something different and just remembering that and you all both do such a great job of reminding us of that fact. Um, you know, one of the things I kept as I'm listening to you, we're so focused on students, but you also keep reiterating how important it is that we have our high qualified and well-prepared educators and how important those teachers are. And we know that from research, but we also know that from the practical. And um, I just was curious, um, you know, we know that recruitment and retainment has been a struggle before COVID in our state. And yet I know it's probably going to be even harder given in, in the next couple of years. What advice do you have, Elena, in terms of what districts, ed, um, prep programs, or even those who might be thinking about being a teacher, how do we make sure we can recruit and retain excellent teachers for our students? Yeah, so it's been settled. We know that the single greatest impact in a child's education within the school building is the quality of that child's teacher. There is nothing more important than recruiting and retaining a high qualified staff for our kids and specifically our classroom teachers. Um, and we really have an opportunity here to welcome people back, uh, to set the tone for the year, to be more innovative, to be more malleable, and to welcome our educators that are returning to us and be uh, welcome them with open arms and support, and also to do so for our new teachers. I firmly believe that teachers are the professionals in the building and we should be listening to them. So my suggestions to district leaders and to principals is to be visible throughout the day and accessible to your staff um, and specifically that you're there to listen to and hear their needs and what they need to do the best job each and every day in the classroom and then to execute that for the teachers, whatever it is that they that they need um, there. And then in terms of thinking about preparing um, educators um, that are currently in training in our colleges and universities as they come, you know, I would say to anyone that's considering being a teacher that there is no job that is more important and no job that has a greater reward for the work that you do each day. It, it is difficult to describe how incredible it is to watch a kid walk across a graduation stage when they're 18 years old and to enter into the world and know that you had an impact on that. So there's no job more important um, and no job more meaningful and certainly um, something that we hope everyone will consider as they move on into their careers. As we think about uh, the work that we do to you know, recruit and to retain teachers, I want to shout out to our state, which is doing some great things as far as through Pepsi and other organizations and looking at different licensure pathways, licensure system, and how we make the profession more accessible to teachers. So uh, I would be remiss not to mention the great work that's happening behind the scenes to redesign some of these systems and um, making sure that we provide opportunities and support, ongoing support for teachers, whether that is, you know, professional learning structures, um, uh, mentors and support for teachers, but also things like co-teaching and advanced teaching roles and multi-classroom teachers, you know, those types of structures that are put in place help to um, support teachers to build them up to make sure that we're retaining um, teachers. Well, similarly, we know that principals are the second most important factor, right? School related factor that impacts student learning. And so we're so fortunate as a state to have both of you in these principals of the year, the, this year and last year. Uh, Keisha, I'm curious about what support do you think principals need right now? Because I have to tell you, I know and love a lot of principals and they're tired even in this going back and yet they're so excited to have students back. And so, but there wasn't a lot of recovery time with summer programs and other things. And so what support do we need and how do we make sure we keep having those people and those school leaders um, for our kids? You know, principals, um, they do a lot of heavy lifting and, and they are responsible um, and, and serve students, teachers, families, everyone. And so I think it's so important that we encourage and emphasize the importance of self-care. Um, oftentimes we go hard all day long, the first one there, the last one to leave, working on the weekends. And there are times where we have to um, get the work done because we have people that are relying on us, but I think it's important that uh, our district level leaders and across the state, we, we need to make time to make sure that principals um, are taking care of themselves 
so that they can be the best versions of, of themselves so that they can serve their people. I think that, you know, we always creating some time to collaborate across schools and across districts. I think there are great things that are happening uh, out there and there are solutions to problems, but we have to connect and create these networks um, so that we can have access to that and have some great conversations about how do we address some of the issues that kind of plague all of us? Um, you know, I think always principals need flexibility and in, in, in making decisions that are unique to their districts and schools. Uh, however, ensuring still that we're all working towards that same goal and vision, but that flexibility allows uh, to make some decisions for their students and for their teachers within their school and districts. I would love for you each just to share your last bit of advice for families as they get ready to support their students for this school year. Keisha, I'll start with you. Okay. Well, I, I think connecting with our families, it's it's so necessary and, and, and we have to make sure that we are meeting the needs of our family. But the advice I would give to our families is to, you know, stay connected with your teachers and your school, find ways that your voice is heard because we can't do this work without you. Uh, families know their child the best, they know their needs the best. And so as much as we can connect with them and elevate their voices, I think we can create a better tomorrow and creating systems that are working and producing positive outcomes for our students. I want to um, say one more piece of advice for parents. As a mother of three children myself, I just wanna tell you that you're doing a great job. <laughs> So you are doing a great job being a parent. So don't ever, ever think that that's not true. And thank you for your support. Well, thank you all so much uh, for joining us. And um, we look forward to talking with you again throughout the year. After the break, we will talk with students about the start of the school year. I'd like to welcome to the show, Hadley Farrell, a rising freshman at Rockingham County High School in Reedsville, and Kennedy Blue, a rising sixth grader at Ligon Middle School in Raleigh. Thank you both so much for being with us. I know that you're getting ready for school to start, and I just wondered, how are you feeling about going back and being in the classroom and also being at a new school? Nervous, but also excited. It'll, it'll be different because I'm used to being home and wearing a mask and now masks are optional for school, but it'll be different switching classes and being around more people than usual. I am excited to see friends, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited, I'm nervous because it's high school, but I'm ready. Can you tell us a little bit about what last year looked like for you in terms of learning, if you were in person or you were virtual or remote? And then how do you think this year is gonna be similar or different? I was virtual the whole time. And I think that this year is gonna be different because I'm in person. What kinds of things did you miss? Mostly seeing my friends and having the teachers like do things like right in front of my face. It's different online. It'll be more hands-on and everyone will be the more the teachers will be more uh I don't I don't know how I would say it but they would be more they're more like helpful to us because in virtual it's very hard to um communicate with teachers when you're not with them in person and so now they'll have a chance to talk to everyone and make sure everyone is on the right track what challenges like when you think about your friends or other students that you know do you think there are challenges that some of students have faced because of the pandemic that school communities can help address this year? Maybe just making sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to, like wearing their masks and kind of putting certain things in place to make sure that everybody stays safe. Virtual students, were some of them are having a hard time keeping up with work and um, just keeping their grades up. But this year, I'm, I think that schools can kind of keep students on a better, like more on task and um, on a better track than last year, than because they were at home and now we're in school and it'll be, it'll be better for the teachers to communicate with the students. We hear a lot about both, right, the physical health that we're so concerned about of our students, but also 
the mental health and kind of that social emotional part of learning that's so important too. Do you think that students are going to need extra support in those areas as well after this year of the pandemic? Some will. I think that it'll be it's hard being home all the time, not being able to socialize and talk or just be around other people. And it's it's hard because it, your health can get away from you if you're by yourself for a very long time. It's uh -huh. hard to go back to socializing and be around other people. I wonder if there are things that you might miss from remote learning. Being able to not have to wake up an entire hour earlier because during this, during the year, I did, my sleep schedule was thrown off because I kept waking up 30 minutes before I was supposed to be on class. And I think I'll also miss not having to put on actual pants. It was nice being able to do um, all the classes at one time instead of it being broken up into like a whole day. Cause I could get most of my work done by 12 by lunch so it was very easy and it was it was ve it was very I like virtual learning because it was fast and I got all my work done and it was just it was easy for me but going to school it'll be more stretched out and it'll it'll be it'll just be longer than it was. I'm curious about what advice you have for other students who are getting ready to go back to school and might be feeling that nervousness and excitement all at the same time what advice do you have for them? I think it's okay to be nervous. I think that it's normal, but it's just like it was before. It's not going to be different. It's just we're coming back and it, it may be a little different because you've been by yourself for such a long time. And now you're coming back to like to socialize and be with your friends and your teachers. But I think it's fine to be nervous and there's no there's no nothing wrong with being nervous and being excited because now we're finally getting back to normal. Thank you so much for being here with us. We so appreciate being able to hear from our students as they embark on a new school year. Thank you for taking time with us to learn and think about education. That's all for today, and we'll see you next week.